Welcome back to Intro to Physical Anthropology. I'm David Leitner. I'm your instructor today. Today we're going to talk about aust uh, robust australopithecines. That's a mouthful. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as paranthropus, a completely different genus, but uh, it means it's referring to the same things, though. Uh, let's get started. There we go. Our first robust australopith is uh, Paranthropus ethiopicus, or Australopithecus ethiopicus. I'm going to refer to them as Paranthropus for the rest, but uh, feel free to use either. 2.7 to 2.5 million years ago. Okay, so this is putting it right around the same time that the genus Homo is getting its start as well. This skull was um, uh, discovered by Richard Leakey and Alan Walker, 1985, again, Lake Turkana. It's known as the Black Skull because the mineral reactions in the soil that created the fossil gave it this sort of black tint to it. Um, we don't have any postcranial remains for Ethiopicus. Um, but some of the defining traits of a robust australopith are here. Notice big, flat cheeks here. Um, huge space in the zygomatic arch and huge uh, mid-satchel crest here. Uh, this is for muscle attachments, chewing muscles specifically. If you hold your fingers at your temples, and move your jaw, you will feel your chewing muscles move. That's because your chewing muscles end right around here. Okay? We don't need a whole bunch of force because we don't eat as many tough foods as Australopiths did. Uh, these guys especially. But their muscles were enormous and attached to this huge area because they had to be really strong. They needed those really robust flat faces because they were putting so much pressure on what they were chewing that it was putting uh, stress on the bone of the skull itself. So it had to be thicker so that it could actually transfer and disperse that stress. Um, really fascinating. So that's true of all the robust Australopithecus. Now, Australopithecus boisei, or Paranthropus boisei, uh, is one of our more recent fellas. Uh, 2.3 to 1.2 million years old from Old Vigorge, Gorge, Maeve Leakey, discovered it in 1959. Uh, and uh, it is the most specialized of these East African robust species. Uh, you can see that face is enormous and one flat plate, uh, practically. In fact, actually, you notice on either side of the nasal ridge there, um, it almost looks like there are like flying buttresses on the cathedral. And that's exactly how they work. Those reinforce the top of the mandible so that when those huge biting pressures are applied, the mandible doesn't snap. Um, it was very large. Its postcranial uh, remains are, are pretty significant. And overall, we're looking at, whereas... You know, afarensis was somewhere around 75 to 88 pounds. We're looking between 75 and 100 pounds for uh, Boisei. That makes it a much larger uh, um, individual. Finally, we've got Australopithecus robustus, Paranthropus robustus. 2.0 to 1.5 million years ago, found in Chrome Dry, South Africa. Africa, Robert Broom, 1938. So again, this is one of those discoveries that lent credence to DART's discovery from 1924 and led to the acceptance of DART's research. Search. Um, isotope analysis suggests um, uh, that there was animal protein in the diet, uh, consistent with insect animal protein, probably termites especially. Uh, this is a really interesting technique because uh, animal, there's certain um, 
uh, elements that uh, animal proteins concentrate that when you eat them will sort of build up in your bones and your teeth. And that is what they're testing for when they do isotope analysis. Um, animal bone wear patterns near uh, robustus suggest that they were used as digging sticks. So again, we've got tool use here. And we shouldn't be too shocked by tool use in general. We know that other primates, lots of other primates, use tools, pass on that information, have tool cultures as well. Uh, chimpanzees certainly do, but also certain kinds of monkeys as well. So we shouldn't be surprised by tool use itself. There may be a huge difference between picking up a bone and using it for digging versus taking two stones, hitting them together just right to create an edge that can be used. Um, and that's the big difference between, we think, human technology and other primate technologies. Okay, the paranthropine phylogenies are just as mixed up as the other phylogenies of, of uh, australopiths. Um, you've got three competing sort of hypotheses. One, Africanus, uh, it, uh, Boisei and Robustus are both descended from Africanus, which is a gracile uh, uh, um, australopith. The other is that you have Afarensis leading to Ethiopicus on one side, which leads to Boisei, Boisei and Africanus on the other side, which leads to Robustus. So in other words, Robustus is a completely separate family line. Finally, you've got um, the theory that Ethiopicus evolves Boisei and Robustus both. So it would still look like Afarensis to Ethiopicus, but then you would have Ethiopicus leading to Boisei and Robustus. Um, so these are the three main sort of phylo phylogenetic hypotheses out there. As always, we're limited by the fossil evidence that we have, and until there's more fossil evidence of these robust australopiths, the, the question is going to remain unanswered uh, as to which of these really is the answer. Um, that's it for the robust australopiths. In the next video, I'm going to actually talk to you a little bit about what how to understand this sort of adaptive radiation of australopiths and what it should tell us about the ancient hominin light landscape. Uh, take care of yourself. Have a great week, and I will see you soon.